Thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Uh, as uh, you have told, I will be talking about the Harappan civilization, but it's a it's a combination of uh, several works which have enabled us to a better understanding now since its discovery in 1924. So I would uh, like to thank uh, uh, first and foremost my guru, my mentor and teacher, Professor R S Bish, who is. Uh, a guest professor at IIT Gandhinagar and also former joint DG ASI, and also to Indian Institute of Technology Gandhinagar, my parent department, Archaeological Survey of India, and Center for Indic Studies, Indus University, for inviting me to talk on this topic, and also my professional colleagues, Professor uh, Mark Kenoyer and Dr. Randall La. And I will be presenting uh, views from many of the uh, scholars who are working on uh, Arapan archaeology. It, it is impossible to name each one of them. And uh, I would be also talking much about uh, Dolavira and, uh, and uh, briefly about Sanoli excavations also, where I, I was also participating. So the story begins in 1924. I mean, uh, whatever we are talking about Harappan civilization, the first uh, Announcement it came in 1924. Uh, from, uh, Dr. Uh, John Marshall, who was the then uh, DGA, so he announced the discovery of uh, Harappan civilization uh, in the Illustrated London News on September 20th, 1924. So he uh, the excavation started at uh, Harappa in 1921 and Mohanjadro in 1922. So after three or four years of uh, deep research and study, uh, they understood. Uh, that it belongs to a single culture and single civilization. So they announced the discovery. So immediately after one week on September 27, 1924, a scholar uh, working in West Asia, Professor A. H. Size, he published an article uh, noting, the, uh, noting the Harappan artifacts found in a datable context from a site known as uh, Susa. So it was found by D. Morgan, D. Morgan, who was excavating and Susa. At a, at a datable context of third millennium uh, uh, BCE, and immediately we got a chronology because at that point of time you need to uh, remember that there was uh, no radiocarbon uh, dates, and uh, uh, this discovery in a datable context from the uh, site of uh, Susa it enabled to fixing a chronology for Harappan civilization. Uh, since then, uh, several excavations have been carried out both in India and Pakistan, and also in Afghanistan. Several areas in Oman, in, in uh, West Asia. So all these things they have enabled to understand our antecedent phases in a better manner. So the leftmost one is the Indus or the uh, Harappan civilization following uh, our Mesopotamia, Oman Peninsula, Egyptian and Palestinian to indicate the chronological uh, framework in which we are working now. So if you look into the Earliest chronology, we always started with the uh, settling of human life previously. We were all hunter gatherers around 8th millennium BCE in the context of uh, Mehergad, a site known as Mehergad in, in Pakistan at present. So the humans, they started to settle down, they domesticated plants and animals. Uh, they also cultivated uh, a lot of other, other crops, including, it, including cotton, as the evidences uh, indicate. So the beginnings of settled human life started here along with that many different technologies also came into uh, being like uh, the, the invention of copper metallurgy and also the invention of uh, potter's wheel so these kind of technologies they, they were also slowly emerging and uh, gradually what is happening is that they are expanding their, their population is increasing they, they were having a surplus in food production so they were enabling to having craft specialization. A lot of craft activities, they are also seen in Mehergad. Some of them, they developed and ultimately reach the Harappan civilization. So we have a very long continuity starting from around the 8th millennium BCE at the site of Mehergad, which gradually manifests into various uh, uh, cultures in the, in the Sindh region, in the, in the modern Punjab region. So all these uh, things uh, put together, they were slowly expanding from the village life to a town life or a larger town life slowly they were expanding into regional cultures what we know uh, call it as a regionalization era 
in which different regional cultures are noticed they had the technology of copper at that particular point of time they also had the technology of lithics or the stone tools making technology so it is known as the chalcolithic uh, uh, age in which we have both the technologies of copper and uh, stone along with various other technologies like pottery making craft activities uh, and uh, different metals also so these regional uh, chalcolithic cultures they they have a uh, different names like the ravi phase or the patra phase or the balakot phase and which ultimately grew into the early harappan culture so early harappan culture it is they are the antecedent phase of the harappan civilization before 2600 bce in many places it varies uh, in, in date starting in the early part of the third millennium bce so we have various uh, early harappan cultures in the modern day a uh, lower sindh upper sindh in gujarat uh, in cholistan desert in uh, in the rajasthan modern day rajasthan region and also in the punjab region so we have uh, several regional chalcolithic culture which ultimately uh, integrate together into the harappan civilization so that is the integration era what we call is that it is the integration of all regional chalcolithic cultures which were flourishing for several centuries in different parts of the region of uh, indus and its uh, uh, and the and the other uh, tributaries uh, and also uh, the uh, saraswati river which is identified with the gagar hakda uh, river systems so all these cultures they combine together they uh, due to several reasons one could be the ideological nature one could be exploitation of raw materials in a very better manner because if you look into the uh, map of uh, geological map of uh, the indus region it's all plains i mean it is full of alluvial plains no raw materials they are available here but the surrounding region the entire surrounding region like the baluchistan northern pakistan aravalli is the gujarat region it is full of raw material resources so the different cultures spread over this entire region they they did not have access to all this raw material so they might have thought of integrating uh, together to have better access of this raw material resources so that they can trade amongst themselves and they can also trade with the external cultures like the mesopotamian civilization so we see an integration around 2600 bce it continued for 700 years uh, up to 1900 bce after which we see a gradual transformation of the urban uh, culture into a rural culture again so several again theories have been put forth for the uh, transformation uh, the recent theories being the climatic change in the climatic regime around uh, 2100 bce which necessitated a long and prolonged uh, drought like situation when we not say a complete drought but a reduction in rainfall led to a uh, change in the uh, cropping pattern might be and ultimately uh, they they had to transform themselves into a rural culture so that is known as the late harappan again we have a regional manifestation of the uh, late harappan culture in sindh in punjab in gujarat uh, and slowly what happens there certain geological changes also taking place the saraswati river it dried up around 1900 bce so the settlements all along the uh, saraswati uh, river it all uh, they were all abandoned and the there is a gradual shift towards the upstream of the saraswati river or towards the ganga yamuna dwarf so this is the long history of around uh, uh, 10000 years in which we see uh, the uh, the human starting to settle settling down invention of various technologies uh, surplus in food production uh, emergence of uh, smaller towns then larger towns and ultimately cities uh, and integration of all these uh, uh, regional cultures into the harappan civilization and uh, which lasted for nearly 700 years and ultimately they declined around they transformed themselves around uh, 1900 bce they continued to exist they did not uh, uh, migrate uh, uh, as it is believed but they continued to exist in that in the, in the region only the migration what we see is only in the saraswati uh, river plains they slowly migrate towards the upstream otherwise uh, we don't see we don't have any archaeological evidence of uh, migration as such so if you look into the distribution of the harappan site starting from 1947 uh, when we got independence uh, this this is this was the scenario uh, only one site uh, Rang, rangpur it was located in india uh, after the partition otherwise uh, every other known site at that particular point of time it went to pakistan so it was a uh, uh, a kind of uh, eye, an eye opener for the indian archaeologists they uh, they put forth lot of efforts to understand the uh, very nature of the harappan civilization and also 
to explore more areas so that they could uh, discover a large number of Harappan settlements, including uh, including uh, the modern days, uh, uh, modern day Punjab, Rajasthan, Haryana, Western Uttar Pradesh, and also Gujarat. So Gujarat turned out to be one of the most important and prominent centers of Harappan civilization. And you can see the host of uh, Harappan civilization along the Saraswati River, which is identified with the Gar Hakada River systems. So the large number of settlements, they are located in this region uh, and also in the upper, upper reaches. So th this is the uh, huge concentration of you see the Kutch area, particularly they are all filled with the Harappan sites. So this is due to uh, the efforts of various universities, in particular, MS University, Baroda, uh, Deccan College, Pune, M uh, MD University, Rotak, Archaeological Survey of India, State Departments of Archaeology of Haryana, Punjab, Gujarat. So all these uh, uh, departments, it's a collective effort uh, to discover more and more sites. So similarly, in the case of uh, Pakistan, Pakistan Department of uh, Archaeology, uh, various universities, uh, like Harpur University and also regional uh, units, they also uh, explored and also several uh, foreign missions they worked there and they discovered a lot of uh, sites. So now we have a better understanding. First of all, we have now a better understanding of how the cities are located, how the smaller towns and the uh, larger towns they are located. So we, what we understand is a settlement hierarchy. Uh, if we compare the modern day scenario, we have a larger city, a capital, then it is supported by smaller uh, smaller cities than towns and uh, smaller towns and villages and hamlets. So similarly, even in the case of uh, Harappan civilization, it is not that the entire civilization is urban. The, <clears throat> there was an urban nature supported by several uh, smaller settlements like the smaller towns and the larger towns and also the villages. So we have this settlement hierarchy, which is also one of the uh, criteria for a state level society state level society which can be termed as a civilization as such so we have uh, the categories of cities we have uh, six cities uh, in the case of uh, harappan civilization we have larger towns smaller towns then villages and hamlets so th these are the uh, size of the settlements i mean cities which can be uh, termed as cities in the context of harappan civilization they have at least 100 hectare in size uh, even though dolavira uh, falls short of this uh, size criteria the habitation, uh, it, it's only 70 hectares, but the wall settlement, if we put together, it comes to 100 hectares. So we have larger towns like Kalibangan, smaller towns like uh, Khirsara, villages, uh, uh, villages like uh, Bhagwanpura, hamlets, uh, uh, hamlets, they are very, very, uh, that could be the largest number, number available. We also have a better chronology now. I mean, thanks to the efforts of uh, various archaeologists working in different parts of uh, the country and also in Pakistan and also the advent of uh, radiocarbon technology, which, which is also known as the C14 technology. We have a better understanding of the uh, chronology as such. I mean, if we, if we look to the earliest phases from Mehergad itself, we have a host of radiocarbon dates from Mehergad, which dates it to 8th millennium BC. Coming to the uh, Harappan civilization in particular, we have several dates uh, uh, starting from around 3300 BCE to 2600 BCE uh, that is grouped under the early Harappan uh, culture. Then we have the Harappan uh, phase that is from 2600 BCE to uh, 1900 BCE. We also have late Harappan uh, cultures uh, in different parts, uh, which is again datable using the uh, radiocarbon technology. So if we look into the overall scenario, now we have a better understanding. Like uh, in the earliest phases, nearly 100 years back, uh, we were only excavating uh, the site. We were describing uh, the findings. Uh, we were publishing them. But now we are we are also putting into a lot of theoretical perspectives. Why this civilization emerged? What were the various reasons for this uh, emergence? And how they sustained? And also, what are the important hallmarks of this civilization? and how it can be comparable with other contemporary civilizations like the Mesopotamian and the Egyptian civilization. So several scholars have put forth the different criteria for understanding a culture as a civilization with its urban character. So uh, Gordon Child, he was the earliest to propose uh, a 10 point uh, criteria. He proposes a 10 point uh, uh, criteria for, uh, for understanding a state level society. But later on, several other scholars, they have uh, uh, walked into, they have added or they have combined together some of the criteria of uh, Gordon Child. 
And uh, in this regard, the Harappan civilization, four criteria have been uh, put forth by an uh, uh, American archaeologist known as Mark Kenoyer. The first and fourth, foremost is the surplus in food production. Uh, unless until we have a surplus in food production, we may not uh, build a city, we may not build a, a, a civilization, we may not uh, support people, we may not support the craft activities. The first and foremost should be a surplus in food production. So that is uh, the basic necessity and that was also facilitated due to the domestication of uh, uh, plants which started nearly 5,000 years back. So we have 5,000 year uh, of cycles of uh, uh, trial and error might have enabled perfection in the uh, in the cultivation process and that's how they reached a surplus in food production and also enabling the craft activities. So they, they bettered uh, the, uh, the climatic uh, conditions also, they understood the climatic uh, cycles. They also adopted the summer and the winter cropping pattern, which goes back to the Harappan times or even much, much earlier. They, they, they selected particular crops which can be grown in summer season and which can be grown, grown in the winter season, winter season. So the next important criteria is the social and economic trade networks that enabled the uh, that enabled the better management of resources between the raw material resources and the major habitational zones as i told you earlier the indus plains it is full of allu alluvium it is devoid of any raw materials even grinding stones for making a uh, flour it is not available so they have to depend upon distant raw material resources so they have to be better organized they have to pull in resources they have to have better communication with the regional uh, 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 cultures and they have to also give something in uh, in 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 uh, bargaining or in, they have to give something in return. So this is how they they manage it. I mean they identified important raw material resources, distant regions, and they procured them through a very good network of uh, communication and also some uh, maybe family tie-ups or uh, or clan tie-ups. So that could be also some of the reasons. So the examples in this regard, regard is the agate carnelian. Uh, resources from Gujarat. So Gujarat was, is the only area from where agate carnelian uh, was found, I mean, which was used to manufacture these kind of beads. So agate carnelian was used to manufacture these kind of uh, beads and they were uh, uh, procuring the raw metal from Gujarat resources and distributing it to distant regions like Mohanjadado, Arapa, Rakhigadi, and also finished products to the West Asian regions. And uh, similarly, Steatite from uh, Hazara, that is the northern Pakistan resources, they are reaching Dolavira. So in, it is in the return. I mean, from Gujarat, it is going, uh, Agate Carnelian is reaching the northern uh, regions, and the, from the northern region, Steatite is coming back. So this could be the kind of bargaining or the return process which they were uh, following. So the next important re, uh, criteria is the complex technologies. Complex technologies means particularly for the specific needs of state level societies. The emergence of state level societies immediately saw the emergence of hierarchy, uh, the leader, maybe the ruler, the administrator, maybe the priest clan, uh, maybe some important merchants, traders who became wealthy through the co course of time. So it, it became a difference in class. So the difference in class also enabled to procure uh, various sophisticated raw materials, maybe important jewelry. So a differential uh, hierarchy, it also enabled uh, better technology to cater to their needs. So what we see is that some of the important uh, complex technologies, they emerge uh, during the Harappan civilization is this uh, production of this agate carnelian beads and also a particular type of bangles known as stoneware bangles. So these two uh, important technologies which emerge during the Harappan technology, they also disappear after that. So these were developed only to cater to specific conceptions of a society. So this is also one of the criteria and the fourth one is the differential social hierarchy. We have seen the settlement hierarchy, but here it is the social hierarchy, uh, higher uh, upper class and the lower class or different classes, different economic uh, uh, wealth, uh, different uh, political power. So this created a, a divide among the people and it also reflected in the in the architecture in the in the in the burials in terms of uh, putting a lot of uh, ceramics or a lot of wealth inside so what we see is that uh, putting together all these uh, four criteria which also falls within the range of the garden child's uh, initial proposition so we see a set of uh, uh, important uh, 
or criteria which cri could have enabled the emergence of the Harappan civilization. And all these criteria, they are met in the case of Harappan civilization. We have excellent examples for each and everything. And during the course of this uh, uh, talk, you can, you can always uh, see some of the important examples uh, uh, depicted through and through. We have around 1200 Harappan sites so far, I mean, in India and Pakistan put together. But there are only two sites which are on the World Heritage List. So World Heritage List is a, is, is a, is a list compiled by the World Heritage Committee of the, of the UNESCO to indicate, uh, uh, to indicate a universal heritage. I mean, that heritage belongs to the entire humankind. It does not belong to a single community or a nation or a, or a country, but it belong, belongs to the entire humankind. And it is the duty of the entire humankind to protect them. So in this case, in the case of Harappan civilization, we have two sites which are in the World Heritage List. One is uh, Mohanjodro, which was inscribed in 1980. And now we have uh, also to boast uh, Dolavira, which was inscribed only last year in 2021. So this is uh, another important aspect if you look into it, because uh, we need to look into the various aspects of the civilization and also have to promote them to educate the public so that they can also understand uh, their, their past. So there are many recent discoveries also being uh, made like in the in the in the case of uh, uh, new discoveries we can say in the in the pakistan region a site known as lakhanjadoro which was known earlier also but uh, recently due to the uh, due to the developmental activities happening in the suburb of a, a city known as sakhar sakhar in sindh so vast vast deposits have been found and it, it uh, enabled the archaeologists to understand that, that it could be equivalent of uh, equivalent of mohenjadaro it's a huge mound and uh, it, it spreads over an area of nearly 3 square kilometers so you, you, you can see there are various uh, various mounds various habitational areas spread across a huge area and also somehow also yielded the Harappan seals. So it's it's a kind of a you can see that this is from a Google uh, Google uh, map uh, borrowed uh, from uh, Professor Mark Noyer. You can see the habitation areas all over and in between wherever space available, they have found some important habitational deposits. Similarly, in the case of Rakhi Gadi, it has been claimed by Professor Vasan Shinde that it 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 should be the largest Harappan site. I mean, he has identified nearly uh, nine occupational areas. Uh, and putting together all these nine uh, habitation areas, he estimates uh, the size of this city could be over 400 hectares or even more than that, even bigger than Mohenjo-daro. But ultimately, one need to understand the urban character and the kind of buildings, the sophisticated architecture, the drainage pattern, and the kind of hallmark uh, uh, findings from Mohenjo-daro. It is incomparable. I mean, if we if we start to compare Mohenjo-daro and Rakhi Gadi. I, I believe it, it is incomparable. I mean, one, if we only take the uh, size as a criteria, uh, maybe Rakhi Gadi may be the largest, but if we look into the overall urban nature, overall examples of architecture and other urban features, Mohanjadra is incomparable. Maybe Harappa uh, was similar to that, but Harappa was completely looted by the uh, railway contractors. They removed uh, millions and millions of uh, bricks from the site of Harappa uh, in, in 1850s. Uh, that's why they, they, they were completely uh, lost, lost to us. In the case of architectural uh, remains, Dolavira is an excellent example where because of the stone architecture, large uh, uh, buildings, they, they are still uh, available to us. But in the case of uh, most of the settlements, they were constructed using mud bricks. So we don't have evidence uh, of many of the things. One more site which, which deserves attention is in Pakistan again in the Cholistan a desert very close to our uh, Rajasthan uh, region that is known as Ganveriwala. Ganveriwala is not excavated so far, uh, but uh, many surface findings and uh, other other uh, indications they clearly indicate it's a large urban uh, character, and that is also one among the six largest uh, Harappan sites. So these kind of typical Harappan uh, ceramics, a uh, copper uh, Harappan seal, and also. Uh, some of the typical Harappan uh, motifs are the the, the the kind of depiction seen from other sites, which uh, which is also seen here. Like in this case, uh, a seated uh, a person is shown the seated yogic posture, which which is uh, very much similar to the so-called uh, 
uh, Pashupati seal or the uh, Pashupati seal from some site of uh, Mohanjadadu. So these are some of the uh, recent wines and similarly Farmana, which was again excavated uh, uh, by Professor Shinde and uh, Osada and uh, Akinori. It has also brought to light some very important facets of, uh, of an urban center in the heart of uh, Haryana. So this has also enabled to understand a large uh, uh, complex having, having uh, many many structural elements and also a huge symmetry complex uh, was also discovered here so these are some of the important uh, uh, recent uh, fi findings one can say now we come to dolavera coming to dolavera we can uh, better understand uh, many of the important criteria required to fulfill uh, for a state level society so dolavera is located in the, on the island of kadir here here is a location it's on the great in the great run of kutch uh, and uh, this this could this could be the kind of moment during the harappan period so if you look closely and if we uh, take into account some of the hypothesis put forth by different scholars including uh, posal who uh, who uh, hypothesized that there, there could be a corridor connecting the little run with the lothal uh, the sea level might have been higher or the land level might have been lo uh, lower which could have enabled navigation so if you uh, if we take into account all these uh, all these theories and hypotheses put forth by different scholars and also taking into account some of the uh, accounts of Periplus of the Eritrean Sea uh, from 2000 years back who, who indicate that the run of Kutch was navigable. So we what we see is that uh, there are no Harappan sites along the Saurashtra coast, which is also a known fact. It is not a new fact, but uh, uh, no Har Harappan sites on the Saurashtra coast. But there are Harappan sites on the, on the northern coast of Saurashtra but the kutch is full of harappan sites so this could have be uh, this can uh, could be cited as a very important uh, evidence to indicate uh, uh, that the harappans they were circumnavigating the kutch they were also navigating through some of the resources into lothal directly and they were not coming through the saurashtra coast even today uh, nal sarovar is a very huge water uh, inland water lake one can say um, uh, from where several water networks also leads into the Gulf of Kambar. Only uh, this northern portion is devoid of any river, but uh, that could have been also used in a, in a better manner by the Harappans, partly land route or partly water route that could have uh, enabled them to reach reach the Lothal. So if we if we take into account all these things, I mean this could have this kind of uh, navigation pattern might have existed at that particular point of time. Uh, and uh, Dolavera was located here, maybe due to some important reasons. It is on an island uh, and very well protected and, and also controlling a vast network of raw material resources, procurement and distribution pattern. And it, it, it also connected many different regions. It was connecting uh, the northern settlements to the river networks. It was connecting the settlements along the Makran coast uh, with, the, with the marine network and also the trade with the West Asia to another marine network. So this kind of uh, an important factor of controlling raw material resources and also distributing them to distant uh, regions might have enabled Dolavira to emerge as a very important uh, cent center. And adding to that is the plethora of raw material resources. So if we plot all the raw material resources, thanks to uh, Dr. Randallah, who has compiled a host of uh, raw material resources available all, all over the Harappan civilization. You can see uh, the shell resources are available here all along the Gulf of Kutch coast uh, and also the Khambath coast. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, then uh, these uh, white white triangles are steatite, steatite resources. Uh, the white circles are lead and silver resources and also uh, agate carnelian. Whatever the reddish color you are seeing, there are agate carnelian which uh, comprise the most important component of the Harappan craft activities. So the Gujarat region is full of raw material resources. Some of them, they were very much essential for the urban, urban uh, uh, character, urban elites, uh, and also long distance trade. So the location of Dolavira itself might have been identified after a prolonged uh, survey and also understanding the uh, landscape because it is located in a semi-arid region the water resources is not available. So they located Dolavera in such a place that they can get uh, water uh, 
during the during the rainy season flowing from the high hills on the on the north and northeast flowing to two streams manhar and mansar and dolavera is located somewhere here so this is the ideal location so that uh, they located the city between two streams and the city uh, dates back to around uh, 3200 bce the earliest uh, occupation at dolavera which consisted of a small small fortress we also have ceramics to indicate some context from the uh, sindh region so the earliest city at dolavera is a small fortress located in the southern part of the present uh, city and having connects with the connections with the sindh region and also evidences of very early uh, bead manufacturing and also copper metallurgy and other important craft activities the the city slowly emerged and slowly uh, grew in uh, grew in size and the full configuration of the city it, it was reached around 2700 to 2600 bc just just before the urban phase of the harappan harappan civilization so we see contacts we see the images of the harappan ceramics and a full grown uh, configuration of the city it, it emerged around 2600 bc or 2550 bc and we see different uh, characters of a of an urban center we see fortification all around we have different uh, fortifications uh, for different uh, groups of people maybe we have a, another fortification for merchant communities or the traders or the agriculturalists and pastoralists we have uh, a open settlement for other groups so what we see is a gradual growth but the city was conceived much much earlier unlike the unlike the cities of mohenjodaro and the harappa they were all organic growth the city was growing much much uh, uh, faster and also population is coming and then the fortifications they were all uh, constructed but what we see here is that the fortifications they were constructed and then the habitation might have been uh, enabled here that is that is supported by the by the presence of habitation areas in the case of uh, uh, middle town here we see vast vacant vacant spaces here the habitation is restricted in this in this portion and the city grew in this uh, in, in in this direction so what we see is the earliest phase the occupants were located here and gradually they expanded in this region like with the lower lower town earliest phase located here and gradually they expanded towards the north and also towards the northwest so this kind of pattern it clearly indicates the city was uh, uh, the constructed much much uh, before conceiving uh, conceiving the movement of people uh, later and that also attracted a movement of people from other parts of the harappan civilization some other important characteristics of harappan civilization they were uh, they are located north to south oriented north to south but uh, deviating from the from the true north either towards the west or towards the east dolavera is also west of the true north so this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, planning is also seen seen there and what what is happening after 1900 bc is that the city gradually shrunk shrunk in size and also the urban characters they also start to disappear so we see new elements of ceramics they appear from the rajasthan region like in this case it's a black and uh, black and red ware what we see black and red ware uh, with uh, white color paintings that is coming from the chalkultik uh, uh, part of uh, rajasthan so we see a uh, uh, kind of uh, um, people uh, adapting to different strategies and different technologies but the harappan elements continue here in in the, in the form of uh, seals uh, in the form of bead manufacturing so all these things continue here in the late harappan time period also and ultimately it declines around 1400 bce and we see the city completely abandoned around around this time period so this is the complete history clearly indicating some of the most hallmark elements of a urban civilization and that is more exemplified by the fact that the city was well planned with the ratios and proportions uh, professor bisht and uh, uh, professor michel darino who is working on the metrology and also the various ratios and proportions they have identified the adoption of uh, meticulous planning meticulous uh, uh, ratios and proportions at the, at this uh, site so only one example i i will i will tell you i mean if we draw a diagonal of the entire city the the meeting point of this diagonal it, it is exactly at a cross road of two important uh, streets so this is the kind of planning i mean 
how how they could have uh, done that i mean it's very uh, difficult to comprehend but this is the kind of uh, uh, planning what they what they did and they also adapted and we see the architecture most of the places like in uh, harappa and mohenjadaro even though we know that there were gateways there were fortifications we didn't know the full configuration but here due to the better state of preservation we can understand the architecture of the gateways and also how the gateways might have been approached what what could be the kind of security arrangement and all those features could be very easily understood because of the better preservation of uh, uh, architecture here so this is the most important gateway at at dolavira this is known as the northern gateway there's a central passage with two chambers on either side and th there is a door here i mean th this this door is depicted here and once they pass through the door again they have to climb the staircase but the staircase it was uh, increasing in height depending upon the uh, occupational levels inside the city once the city could be directly approached uh, uh, at this level but later on when the occupation level increases within the city they had to also raise the staircase also so we also see evidence of this kind of sophisticated architectural members particularly at the site of dolevera previously these kind of stone members they were found uh, uh, these kind of stone members they were found from mohenjadaro and harappa but their exact meaning and exact uh, uh, context could not be understood until the discovery of uh, dolevera even dolevera also the late harappans they disturbed they disturbed the pillar elements from their original location there are different kind of pillar members one can see here that's a square shaped pillar members that's a plane that's a biconvex uh, and also biconcave pillar members so this is the kind of uh, destruction which was also caused during the late harappan times but fortunately from one of the gates eastern gate we see uh, the pillar members in situ uh, you can you can see the arrangement here uh, during excavation so on reconstruction what we uh, can visualize is that uh, uh, three square pillars followed by a biconcave and followed by two biconvex pillar members and over there there was a wooden column so this is the kind of uh, arrangement one can understand uh, uh, i mean there could there could be a uh, two two bi biconcave and there was a there was a uh, wooden wooden uh, pillar and here also there was a wooden wooden pillar here there is a wooden pillar to so support the roof so this was the kind of architecture what we derive from the case of uh, dolavira and how the pillar members they were manufactured again we have evidence from a quarry site nearly 3 to 4 kilometers northeast of dolavira from where we still have unfinished pillar members this pillar member is still unfinished there it is equivalent to this biconcave uh, 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 pillar member and once they were manufactured here at the site completely finished weighing nearly 300 to 400 kilograms they were transported across the run of catch to sites like mohenjadaro and harappa only two sites outside dolavira we see uh, the the location of uh, uh, these kind of pillar members so this is a beautiful piece of evidence to uh, uh, link all the sites and also the better exploitation of resources so this is the pillar member from mohenjadaro these are from harappa and you can very well notice notice the patterns here this this is very much typical of the dolavira pillar element so one one more type of uh, pillar element also we see from the case of harappa it's a wavy pillar element uh, and uh, made of buff uh, sands uh, buff limestone which is also available in the uh, dolavira island so again uh, the different markets uh, needs could have been met uh, by the dolavira merchant so you can see the depiction of this pillar uh, elements here in a terracotta molded column again from lakanjadaro you can see this uh, biconvex elements uh, these these two elements they are depicted here and the wavy pillar element this wavy pillar element could be this one so there could be a possibility that there are many more sites from where this kind of pillar elements could have been uh, used uh, uh, which is indicated in this terracotta terracotta model so looking into the kind of hierarchy looking into the social structure dolavira again gives a very good example uh, because of differential settlements for example this is the castle which is very important uh, because of its massive character if you look at the uh, size of the fortification it is very high 16 meters in height 18 meters in width at the base uh, and having two important gateways uh, eastern and the northern gateway and if you look at the security feature i mean uh, these settlements cannot be uh, accessed very easily the eastern eastern gate uh, it had at least uh, three 
levels of security arrangement if we look to the northern gate it has at least five levels of security feature i mean one has to one has to enter a, a vast open space either from the east gate or the west gate then there are again gates at very different different levels so at least five security levels have to be passed before one can enter into the settlement itself so this is the kind of sophistication or this, this is the kind of uh, importance of the individuals who are living inside this uh, a settlement so this is this is the kind of uh, a reconstruction uh, uh, we we have tried into uh, mostly the wooden architecture might have been there which is lost uh, completely so these are the open spaces which which i was mentioning which could have been also used as uh, reservoirs even today uh, rain water uh, uh, stagnates here uh, creating an impression that that could be uh, uh, a reservoir here and there are many open areas all around uh, the habitation which could have been used as a, a huge uh, area, a huge reservoir area but the harappans did much much more they put dams they created dams they uh, uh, put some boulders all along the uh, river bed to control to check the flow of water because the 13 degree uh, gradient uh, it's a deep slope so they have to check the flow of water otherwise they will devastate everything so they put lot of water breakers uh, on on this both rivers and they constructed dams so that they can divert the water water into reservoirs eastern reservoirs and the southern reservoir so we have excellent uh, examples of how water reservoirs might have uh, created there is a speculation that even the site of harappa and kalibanga might also have water reservoirs but that has to be uh, checked and uh, uh, checked uh, in the in the future investigations only so this is one of the most important reservoir southern reservoir you can see it is completely uh, cut into the bedrock and it is uh, it is at least uh, twice the size of uh, the great bath of uh, mohenjodaro and it consisted consisted of series of five reservoirs and this is the third one two two more on this side and two more uh, on the other western side so uh, this is this is the central uh, reservoir there are uh, two more reservoirs here and here so they are interconnected the overflow from this reservoir reaches here and then it reaches here and ultimately it is fed into the open space so similarly on the eastern side it is the largest uh, fresh water reservoir of uh, uh, of the harappan civilization one can say it measures around 78 meters and reached by three flight of steps uh, on the northeast northwest and the southwest uh, and at the at the uh, and along the eastern wall it also has a step well and it can be uh, stated as the earliest step well of uh, gujarat or the earliest step well of uh, even south asia again it is cut into the bedrock reaching the water table here somewhere with a flight of steps construction of barriers at least uh, at least three phases of construction so it was used for a pretty longer period whenever there was a lean period the water reaches at the lower level so they dug a a uh, step well here and coming to the craft activity which was specifically meant for the elites and also for a long distance trade so dolavira has a very beautiful uh, evidence of this uh, craft activities uh, in the form of this kind of uh, uh, drill bits drill bits which were essentially used to perforate a beads i mean this uh, this craft person pratap bai is the only surviving uh, person in khambar who still practices the traditional method of drilling the stone beads i mean after him there is no one left i mean that's a, a dad necessity that we should document uh, uh, these kind of craft activities and also uh, make provisions in our institutions to have uh, exhibitions to honor them and also to highlight their important craft activities so these kind of drill beads uh, they they are they are fitted on wooden shafts and they are uh, driven by a bow drill and these drill bits uh, they they were manufactured uh, from these raw materials known as ernestite and what is ernestite we don't know we don't know the ge geological provenance where it comes from we don't know how the harappans got it we don't know but at least uh, we know that the raw materials were available to them and they were manufacturing this kind of drill bits enabling perforation into the gate carnelian beads uh, which are only slightly less harder than ernestite so if you want to perforate a, a stone you need either of equal hardness or another stone of uh, higher hardness but here the harappans they were fortunate enough to find an element find a stone 
known as Ernestaita. So with that, they could perforate uh, the beads, their manufacturing ex exquisite jewelry. And these are the decorated uh, uh, carnelian, uh, carnelian beads, which are variously known as the etched carnelian beads uh, or, or the uh, bleached carnelian beads, which has a single eye decoration, then double eye decoration, triple eye decoration, multiple double eye, and, and also human-like representation. So if you take this as, uh, as eyes and this as the mouth, so it, it, it clearly, it, it clearly depicts a human human face so this is the kind of uh, depiction which were which were done by the harappans and they were also exporting then to the mesopotamians they were also manufacturing one more particular exquisite jewelry known as the long long barrel beads long barrel cylindrical beads and which is very much hallmark of the harappans and it was used to manufacture these kind of waist belts this is a complete uh, uh, waist belt uh, which comes from Alhadino, and there are only two more sites, uh, Mohanjadaro and Harappa, from where we find this kind of complete uh, waist bands. They are very rare in nature, and uh, ultimately they were worn by the uh, uh, females. You can see the depiction of the waist belt uh, in one of the terracotta figurines uh, uh, from Mohanjadaro. So they, these these are the exquisite jewelry. I mean, of agate carnelian. Uh, silver jewelry, gold jewelry, uh, which were used by the Harappans. So the technological uh, investigations of this uh, drill bit from Dolevirai has enabled us to better understand the drilling process, uh, the various kind of uh, transformations, the drill bits which undergo during their drilling process. And we could document nearly uh, 1500, uh, 1586 drill bits from different parts of the city. And it clearly indicates the middle tone was the hub of activities happening here. And Dolavira dominated the bead manufacturing industry because Harappa, it has uh, it has only 65 drill bits, such such drill bits. So one can understand the Gujarat Harappans. They were dominating. They were manufacturing more. They were proximity of their with the raw materials and also the better technology was available with them. So I briefly told about Pratap Bhai. There is one more uh, uh, craftsman at uh, at uh, Khambat. Uh, Anwar. So this, this was his workshop in 2007. I documented this workshop in 2007, but now it is completely gone. They have constructed a, he has sold the uh, area and there is a, there is a completely two storied building come up here. So this is what uh, I'm stressing upon. We need to highlight uh, the craft activities because it is dying very fast because we don't have uh, uh, any market for these activities. Uh, so this, uh, this small workshop, it included a chipping area, polishing area, and also a area for heating because the agate carnelian when it is found it it is it is one it is only yellow yellow yellowish orange in color but when it is heated in three cycles three cycles of heating it enables transformation into completely reddish in color so that is the kind of color which was preferred by the Harappans. So we also see uh, the location of various raw materials and their uh, distribution networks. So this distribution networks were studied extensively by Randall Law. This is also studied by Randall Law. So you, you, you can see uh, this, this kind of agate, which is, which is uh, uh, found in Dolavira, and the same material is found in Harappa, raw material and a finished bead. So this is very very unique and it was really because this site Harappa was excavated by Kenoyer and when we were studying the uh, beads uh, uh, from Dolavira and Harappa, he immediately pointed out, look, I mean, this kind of raw metal, which is also available at Harappa from within the city and from one of the burials, a bead manufactured out of this raw metal it is found around the neck of a person. So this is the kind of interaction, this is the kind of long distance trade uh, uh, which has been uh, enabled due to integration of the different uh, regions of the Harappan civilization. So again, uh, Randall Law, uh, he has compiled various raw materials, uh, and one can one can understand this is this is the Indus plains devoid of any raw material, and the raw all the raw materials they are spread all around the all around the Indus uh, plains. So they were uh, procuring this raw materials from different uh, uh, regions, and they were redistributing to different uh, uh, places. 
So in this aspect, one more uh, very important uh, uh, material for long distance trade is the grinding stone. Nowadays, we, we can go to the market and purchase uh, uh, the attar, right? It is ready, readily available. But what about the ancient times? They have to put extra efforts to grind the cereals uh, by themselves, and they have to find very hard uh, stones for making the grinding stones, particularly uh, the grinding stones, uh, the raw material having quads or quartzite. They were particularly very much suitable. Also, some of the sandstones, they were suitable. So. Uh, Scholars working in the Haryana and Punjab region, they, they, they are well aware of this particular kind of uh, grinding stone, which has a black streak. I mean, here this is a black streak. So this is very much unique of a, of a stone found, found from Kalyana Hills in Rajasthan in, in Haryana. So this is the area uh, of uh, Kalyana Hills from where they were getting this kind of grinding stones. Uh, and uh, even today, uh, these kind of uh, uh, stones, they were used for grinding stones in this particular village uh, at the foothill of this uh, village, which is uh, widely uh, preferred by many of the local villages. So during the Harappan period, uh, they were using uh, this particular stone and also another kind of stone known as the grey sandstone, which is available uh, available from the Gagar, uh, Gagar river beds. Uh, they can just procure the pebbles and they can make different type of uh, grinding stones. So the, from the site of uh, Karanpura, it's a, it's a Harappan site. Uh, uh, we found both these varieties of uh, uh, Delhi quartzite uh, from Kalyana and also the grey sandstone from the Shiva Lake. So uh, all the uh, occurrences of this kind of uh, granite stones were plotted. And if we look into the uh, pattern, uh, Kalyana Hills is located somewhere here. So this important uh, settlement, it was participating in the trade of uh, transporting this kind of uh, raw materials. Uh, and ultimately, this uh, this grinding stone it was also reaching Harappa. That is the beauty. I mean, Harappa is another 200, 300 kilometers uh, from the, from this place. Uh, from here, maybe 400, 500 kilometers. So the the preference for a particular type of hard stone for making flowers it was very much uh, felt during the Harappan period because that is the basic diet for them. Right? They have to prepare bread, uh, bread from out of this flower. So this kind of uh, long distance trade specifically looking for certain important raw materials were also possible uh, uh, during the harappan period and we uh, another stone which we documented is from the shivalik uh, hills and it was reaching a current for this type of uh, particular gray sandstone so we can we can look into these various aspects uh, of harappan civilization and try to understand how much they have organized themselves to collect the various raw materials and there are various craft activities like the stoneware bangles, which I mentioned earlier. Stone bowls. I mean, these are from Dolavira. They were they were manufacturing stone bowls also, maybe turning on a lathe. And copper metallurgy, very beautiful copper metallurgy. This is a bronze mirror and shell, different type of shell artifacts. And for trading activities, they were manufacturing the shell uh, shirt weights and also different types of. Uh, weights they were uh, manufacturing and it which also has a standardization and what we see is that the authorization of trade which was possible uh, due to the seals and ceilings we have examples of seals as well as uh, the impression of the seals in the form of uh, uh, ceilings this type of square uh, seals they 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 belong to the harappan harappan face uh, at dolavira and this type of rectangular seal they are they are from the late harappan at Dolavira. So we have distinct uh, uh, type of seals at, at Dolavira and the unification process might have been possible because of some ideological uh, uh, commonality which is again indicated uh, uh, by these two important sculptures one from Mohanjadaro and one from Dolavira. They are separated by nearly 400 uh, kilometers from each other but it uh, the sculptures they clearly indicate they have some commonality I mean the, the, here the head is missing uh, head is missing here, but the posture is the same of both these sculptures. Everything is same, uh, but it is very uh, crude here. In the case here, it is uh, much much elaborate. But the posture, the the kind of uh, uh, arrangement of the legs and the hands, it clearly indicates they have their commonality. Even there are uh, certain indications of elite ornaments, like in this case of uh, uh, the so-called the priest king. Uh, uh, from Mohanjadro, what we can see is the head ornament uh, clearly indicating a fillet 
this is the gold fillet and there's a central eye bead there's a gold and a steatite eye bead so we have several examples uh, of of this kind one particular is from harappa itself this is a complete example from harappa and other examples may be from dole where again clearly imitating a gold jewelry it's a copper bead with a central steated one and again a steatite uh, steated one maybe with with another stone so we have very beautiful evidence of similar type of elite jewelry which is not noticed in on other type of uh, figurines or, or artifacts and uh, they also had a distinct uh, burial customs particularly dolevira dolevira people uh, they were uh, very much different uh, in terms of uh, uh, belief system in terms of erection of uh, uh, burials because stone was available in plenty uh, there they were erecting complete uh, chambers uh, cut into the bedrock also lining them with uh, uh, li limestone and sandstone uh, slabs and they were also covering uh, them with uh, limestone and sandstone slabs uh, coming to harappa they have wooden coffins so that is very unique again wooden coffins uh, with lids particularly of devdar devdar trees they were they were also using so this is this is some of the most important uh, uh, aspects of burial uh, practices the harappans they were burying hardly uh, 5 to 10% of their of their population the remaining population they might be uh, following different type of uh, uh, funerary traditions they might be uh, cremating their dead but we don't have direct evidence but uh, uh, we speculate that since we find very few burials when compared to the uh, population numbers there could be other modes of uh, 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 system also uh, after after death uh, system so in the case of uh, dolevira we have uh, uh, at least at least six examples of uh, tumulus burials tumulus burials are huge earthen mounds uh, nearly uh, 30 meter in diameter. Uh, th this one is uh, having a 20 meter in diameter. Another tumulus is a 30 meter in diameter with a spoked wheel pattern. And within one of uh, uh, within the space between the spokes, there are rituals performed. We don't have complete dead bodies inside. We don't have skeletal remains, but we have evidences of uh, uh, this kind of rituals performed and also some jewelry. This is a complete stated necklace. Uh, and also some gold jewelry which is found inside these uh, burials so this type of tumulus burials this is the uh, uh, 30 meter dia uh, diameter burial which is the largest one at dolavira which is also having a spoked wheel pattern this has direct parallels uh, with the royal burials from bahrain also of the uh, same age i mean this image is courtesy akinori yosegi so one can see the similarities that there could be ideological transmission there could be a relation between uh, uh, these two different cultures there could be influences but at this stage we are unable to exactly uh, specify the kind of influences but this is a, a very important evidence these are the other type of burials from dolivera unlike the other harappan region where wooden coffins are uh, found mud brick lined coffins are also found but here they were having stone slabs stone slabs and covering them also with the stone slabs so this is the kind of uh, arrangement only two skeletal remains have found that belongs to a later period otherwise uh, most of the dolavira burials they didn't have any skeletal remains coming to the ideological aspect again one is the uh, so called uh, similarity between the priest king and the uh, sculpture from dolavira one more very important uh, seal is from Mohanjadro and Dolavira, where a similar depiction is seen. I mean, this kind of uh, uh, depiction, it is it is uh, termed as divine adoration by one scholar known as Martha Ameri, uh, which uh, clearly shows an anthropomorphic figure have, having two horns. So you, you, you are seeing uh, you're seeing an anthropomorphic figure here with the two horns uh, and a kneeling figure. There is a kneeling figure accompanied by a wild goat here and we we see similar depictions from harappa and mohanjadro you can see the, this is the depiction other other depiction from mohanjadro here here the deity is shown the people leaf is shown here uh, and these are the other uh, other depictions you can see uh, again here the makhor is seen here then uh, there's a horned uh, uh, deity uh, shown within the people leaf uh, uh, depiction. So these things are uh, depicted in on multiple seals. Uh, uh, this is the deity and this is the kneeling figure. 
and uh, this is from harappa and again this row of uh, the devotees or the person they are shown here so we we have a similar depiction and also we have a depiction from dolavira even though it is executed very crudely but uh, again it, uh, it it closely resembles uh, uh, the 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 uh, people people leaf depiction the deity standing within that and also the kneeling figure so the, this this is how we can really understand the kind of ideological transmission and kind of unification uh, uh, that might have been possible because of uh, this belief uh, uh, systems and some more uh, discoveries which also enable to understand the eastward movement of the harappan so this is from a site known as sanoli where a large symmetric complex of late harappan period starting from around 1900 uh, 2000 2000 to 1900 bce where were found nearly 116 uh, instances were were documented which also included exquisite jewelry i mean this is the first time in the case of harappan civilization where gold jewelry they were found in large quantities stone beads they were found in large quantities which clearly indicates that the people they are moving away from the harappan region with whatever uh, material remains they were having jewelry they were having and ultimately discarding them when they could not hold them any longer so they also had a very beautiful faience technology faience which is which is a early form of uh, glass they were initially invented to replace the uh, stone beads because stones uh, raw materials it is very difficult to find but they could replicate the patterns on stones on this ceramic material so faience was an important industry during the harappan period and during the late harappan period we find much much more elaboration which is uh, which is uh, uh, found uh, uh, very well in the case of sanoli so sanoli we have multiple burials uh, and in the recent uh, excavations so they have also found that the chariot remains that is again a remarkable uh, discovery uh, which is uh, which is uh, really opening up new chapters in the case of indian, indian archaeology so this this burials particularly uh, it had a chariot uh, uh and uh, we don't know i mean uh, which animal uh, drew this chariot whether it's a horse or a or a, or a, or a bull because we don't have horse remains at this particular point of time it is not uh, represented here uh, either in the case of uh, uh, later up and time period also so it but the discoveries uh, they really uh, uh, throw much much valuable light of the coffin burials uh, the kind of elaborate decoration on the coffins uh, the chariots the copper inlay work on the chariots or the decorative work on the chariots which enabled the, the better preservation of the wooden elements so there are various scientific methods are also available to understand the past population side like in the case of sanoli we did some uh, uh, isotopic analysis uh, i mean isotopic analysis they are very much helpful in understanding the movement of the people the past climatic uh, uh, regimes uh, and particularly the isotope of uh, uh, lead it, it it is very much uh, uh, lead and strontium strontium both these uh, uh, elements they are very much helpful in understanding the movement of the people uh, because uh, whatever we consume it is from the uh, plants and the animals uh, uh, they also grow in in a particular geology and each region has its specific values of lead and strontium so it is all intaken by our body and it is deposited in our bones and the human uh, teeth uh, when we analyze the bones of the human teeth for specific values of uh, lead and strontium because we have already established a database of uh, uh, lead and strontium values for different regions uh, from south asia we can pinpoint from which area this population belong to so the analysis of sanoli uh, population it clearly indicated they all most of them they are from the uh local area but with very few outliers there are mixed population some people they were from outside but we, we can't uh, say at the uh, particular point of stage from which area they came from uh, unless and until we have a complete database of all the human population from the uh, burials of the ancient uh, site so this is one exciting area in which uh, we can go on developing a database so that ultimately at one point of time we can pinpoint uh, the movement of the people and like the dna Uh, d- dna analysis it, it will uh, largely help in understanding a, uh, a a larger picture but not a particular case 
But here in this, in the in the case of isotopic analysis, we can clearly isolate and name each and every individual from where they can come from, provided we have a huge database of uh, the population. And finally, if we uh, if we look to the uh, trade activities of the Harappans, they were sophisticated. Uh, they were producing sophisticated jewelries and also various type of uh, artifacts, and they were exporting it to Mesopotamia. We have various references from Mesopotamia from 2500 uh, uh, BCE. They mention about Dilman. Dilman is located here. Uh, it was identified based on the uh, specific indication in the Mesopotamian sources that it is located in the lower sea. Lower sea is the Persian Gulf for the Mesopotamians, upper sea is the Mediterranean Sea for the Mesopotamians and also some other evidence that enabled the identification of Dilman, then comes Magan. Magan is identified with Oman, modern day UAE and other regions because of the vast copper resources and also Meluha with the uh, Harappan civilization because of the material evidences like agate, carnelian, also seals and ceilings and ceramics. So what we see is that in the Mesopotamian context, we see large quantities of uh, Harappan jewelry. Harappan jewelry, particularly this type of uh, decorated cornelian beads, the long barrel cylindrical beads, uh, they were completely exported. Whatever reddish color you are seeing, they were all exported from the Harappan region only. So a, a list of objects found, uh, references found in the Mesopotamian sources was compiled by Fossil. So it, it mentions carnelian, lapis lazuli, pearls coming from the Harappan region, various type of woods, gisabba, meluha, mesu wood, and fresh dates. And then various type of animals, bird, dog, cat, metal, copper, and gold, and ships of meluhan style. So it's a very important evidence, like the meluhan type ships are different from the Mesopotamian ones. So that's why they are mentioning meluhan type uh, uh, ships. And also Meluhan style furniture, the furniture also different. So the Harappans, they are also exporting furniture and figurines of Meluhan birds. So that is another very important, maybe peacocks and other some important animals which are not available in the Mesopotamian world, the Harappans might have been manufacturing them and exporting them. So these are some of the very beautiful examples of uh, the presence of Harappans in, uh, in, in Mesopotamia from various uh, sites. Uh, and also the recent discoveries in the Oman region also, it is bringing out a, a huge network of the Harappans uh, located there, settled there and, uh, pro, pro, and the further uh, promoting their trade activities. So if we plot some of the Harappan artifacts on a map, particularly the long barrel beads and the decorated beads, you can see it can go even up to Greece, Greece and Turkey, Egypt, Again, Turkey, Central Asia, so it's a vast network. I mean, it, it, it is not that the Harappans directly traded with Greece, but it might have reached through a secondary trading sources also. But we have definitely have uh, evidence of the trade with the Mesopotamian region and the Oman region. So, uh, the, and the, and the Bahrain region. So, Harappans, they, they exported goods to this region and they might have traded with the other regions also. So, this is a very beautiful evidence of. Uh, how the Harappans uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, incorporated various elements from their surrounding areas. So they procured the raw materials. Uh, they sustained themselves with a very good subsistence base uh, for nearly uh, 600 to 700 years. Uh, but uh, the change in the climatic regimes from around uh, 2100 BCE, which might have lasted for another 200 years up to 1900 BCE, it, uh, it enabled a gradual decline of the urbanism and gradually they, they kind of were transformed into a rural culture. So we, we see the rural uh, rural phases of the Harappan culture uh, distinctly in four different regions. Uh, and what we see is that the complete abandonment of the river Saraswati and also the Indus river, no settlements are found. And there's, there's a shift of settlements towards the Ganga Yamuna Doab. And that's it. Uh, with this, uh, I, I conclude the presentation, uh, which can be uh, further lengthy also, but it's very difficult to concise uh, uh, all aspects of the Harappan civilization. I thank once again uh, the Indus University for providing uh, me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, one question that I would like to ask right now is uh, how to interpret 
you know, figures, symbolism that are available on in, in your Rappan sites. Like, how do archaeologists do that? Like, it's just general speculations, or do we have any standard approach of decoding those symbolisms? The, the symbols, in uh, many cases, if we uh, do it on a chronological basis, for example, multicultural uh, sites like Harappa, Mohenjo-daro, and Bulavira. So, if the symbols are depicted on pottery or, or on seals, then they have a particular meaning. Right. And they also have an evolution, like what Kenoyer did at Harappa is that he analyzed the ceramics from the early Harappan period onwards, that is from around 3200, 3300 BC onwards. And what he, what he saw is that initially they were simple potter's mark, uh, vague abstract symbols, but later on it developed into the Harappan signs. So that is a very important uh, uh, evidence. So. Uh, unless until we decipher the Harappan script, we may not completely understand the exact meaning, but this is one way of looking, looking into that. Another approach is that we can have a uh, corpus of all the symbols, the context from which where they are found, because certain graffitis, they are found on the uh, rim of a pot shirt, shoulder of a pot shirt, body of a pot shirt, and also base of a pot shirt. So if we have a complete database of all the graffitis from different sites, different time periods, then we can uh, we can try to understand the particular context and particular meaning also. But meaning, it can be only a hypothesis, unless until uh, maybe if we look into modern day communities, that could be some continuity, like in the case of uh, Dolavira region or Sindh region, even today, even in Rajasthan, some parts of Rajasthan, some communities, they still uh, put some tattoo marks, uh, which, which I feel have continuity of Harappan symbols also, but some of these communities they even they don't understand their meaning. Maybe we it's it's it's, uh, it's a necessity that we should uh, try to document them fast and also try to catch on uh, some people who really understand their meaning. Otherwise, it is it is going to be lost completely. As in the case of the bead manufacturing technology, which I mentioned, it is going to be lost completely unless until we document it and uh, exhibit him in a in that in a proper manner. Uh, so, sir, you are saying that there are still communities that have been following, uh, let's say, uh, the tradition that existed during Harappan time also? Can we see the I, I, I may not say that tradition existed in the Harappan times, but there is some sort of a continuity because they, they also belong to the same region in which the Harappan civilization flourished. Exactly, they, it might not have been followed in the Harappan period, but Continuity, some changes have happened, but there are certain symbols which have similarities. I mean, which I looked uh, into some of the uh, tattoo marks, uh, which was also published by one scholar. Uh, so we we have some, uh, we can speculate some continuity that could be a possibility. But uh, again, it has to be substantiated to a, a wide research as a very good sound approach uh, and documentation process. Right, right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, sir, uh, basically, I was going through some uh, gazetteer and uh, old documents. They there also they have mentioned that Baluchistan, Sin, Gujarat, and Rajasthan, these Rabari community or indigenous communities, pastoral community especially, they are following the same symbol like wo bichhu wala jo depiction hai. They are following the same uh, symbols in Baluchistan, Sin. So they have some sort of lineage. Uh, connection or lineage relationship because these pastoral community move for shorter time period and sometime for longer period. So they have to build a very strong networking for taking the uh, decision, calculated decision. So these symbols can place or these symbols can give us some sort of understanding that at least for social networking kind of thinking, how they have developed a strong bonding, not only har during the Harappan period, uh, after that also early historical even the medieval period okay. definitely i mean definitely there is a possibility that that's why i'm telling uh, we need to urgently document uh, uh, this kind of symbolism from different region and try to correlate them and also uh, do some analysis of how they were interrelated i mean it, i mean there could be migration in the uh, uh, some few centuries backward uh, because uh, some communities in andhra pradesh uh, uh, they are very much uh, similar to the Rabadis. I mean, uh, the way they, they wear the bangles, uh, 
and the kind of embroidered uh, dress material so there could be migration happening uh, during different uh, time period and that's why it is very much essential uh, before this uh, uh, in inner meaning is lost we need to document all of them in a in a systematic manner that is very much essential even they are following the same pattern in their textile also embroidery work also they have certain patterns like rabari have specific patterns then bharwad community have their own specific pattern and they don't uh, exchange those symbols so that is also the beauty of those com uh, these communities so that's why i mean we need a uh, extensive documentation so that we can come to a conclusion and also understand the meaning so that is very much essential exactly so sir i have a question regarding this surplus food production do you feel that this is the surplus food production which uh, brought together different communities or it was a diversity in food culture that uh, connected these different communities like rabaris or in gujarat particularly we have 32 kind of millets so each and every geographical area have their own kind of subsistence pattern so that this is the first question and the second question is can you tell us something about what kind of geographical or what kind of climatic condition was there in gujarat during the harappan period the surplus uh, what i meant is that uh, if if, uh, if uh, a particular region a particular eco zone unless until they they have a surplus in food production they cannot disembark into craft activities unless until they have their own needs satisfied so that was my intention so that might not be the reason for for the unification but that is that is the reason for a further leap into the next technological uh, stage towards uh, the emergence of state level societies and uh, and the second question of uh, the climatic conditions uh, again it might have been different uh, different from the present present day climatic uh, uh, condition but not uh, comparable to the sindh or the punjab region but uh, it could have been a slightly wetter uh, and which which gradually changed towards the end of the third millennium bc okay so uh, sir i have last two questions the first one is like when we do this ethnographical study and we try to connect harappans or any tradition with living communities what should be the uh, major uh, caution when we go to the uh, go for this field work what should be the major cautions one researcher should uh, always have uh, in his or her mind that is the first question and the second question is about how relevant this harappan civilization is for a generation like modern generation what is the relevance of this harappan civilization like we are only talking about in text uh, textbooks or in classrooms but what about the public or what about the masses who don't know about uh, in detail about this harappan culture like city planning town planning and all what what we have thought that these are the modern concept britishers aaye to hamare yahan ye sara technology aaya so how we can bring this in public forum see ethno archaeology it has to be done with caution unless and until you have various connecting dots in between like the two widely separated time periods for example if you are studying the modern day communities and want to correlate with the harappans then you need to have some uh, connecting dots in between maybe some travel accounts of intervening periods or some uh, evidences of architecture like in the case of dolavera we have the uh, stage 7 architecture which clearly shows the emergence of uh, roundish structures which are still followed uh, by the local kutch people so you need to have this uh, this kind of uh, uh, connecting dots and if it, there are no connecting dots then it has to be taken with utmost caution and you cannot directly correlate with the present day Uh, ethnographic evidence with the past that is really uh, dangerous only thing is this ethnographic evidences makes you to understand understand uh, mentally uh, what kind of uh, technologies they might have used what kind of uh, 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 strategies they might have used that's it i mean we cannot completely impose the present into the past coming to what we learn from harappan uh, civilization or what we learn from our past uh, is the way uh, lifestyle i mean i i would say it's not uh, any particular technology or any particular architectural forms it is the way of life i mean if you look at the past with the with the kind of uh, lesser technology with them 
they have adapted particularly in the case of dunga that they have adapted themselves well into the uh, climatic condition they have planned the city in such a manner so that they can harness the water resources uh, uh, during the lean time period so this is what we need to learn i mean in in the in the modern scenario we are over, over dependent upon technology we we use technology for every needs and if it is not available for example even if there is no electricity for one day we are really lifeless so that should not be the case i mean we need to learn that even without the aid of modern technology how we are going to lead a healthy way of life and how we are going to plan our future so that's 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 what uh, the lessons what we learn from our, our past also we we need to learn from our past the kind of mistakes committed in the past so that we can learn from them and we can correct them if you are not going to correct uh, our uh, our past mistakes then it's going to be really hard for the future so that's what the climatic change is also suggesting over the over dependence upon technology over exploitation of raw material resources which is going to ultimately play a, a very great uh, havoc on on our way of life so that's what we need to look okay sir so one more question about sanoli sensational news uh, what is your opinion about this uh, connecting the dots with uh, literature like ramayana and mahabharat or any other epic so i know there are certain political agendas and all but how can archaeology become unbiased and how should be an archaeologist should behave like if we are uh, excavating any site and we are getting such evidences obviously that chariot is very much important archaeological evidence but how we can uh, how we can restrain ourselves to uh, interpret these kind of uh, these kind of interpretation the like answer i think the answer lies in your very question that uh, we need to restrain ourselves only to the facts what we find from the excavation and not to deviate anything superfluous manner i mean we should not imagine we should not speculate we should not uh, over work the evidences so we have to restrict ourselves to what the evidence that has come from right and try to also understand in the overall uh, cultural milieu and we cannot uh, we cannot correlate a particular time period in such a manner that we need to push back the chronology of other cultures right i mean it is really uh, maddening and we should really restrict ourselves to what the evidence says and with a more objective manner and comparing literature it's it's another very uh, tricky thing it's very difficult unless and until you have uh, correlatable evidence without that uh, we should not connect with the literature okay thank you so much sir